All right, well, welcome back. Um, as you're joining, if you can post in the chat where you're joining us from, that would be great. No, just to no, see no, no. Uh, where you're joining us from. Again, if you can try to remember to keep yourself muted, um, I'm going to be muting everyone. But um, as you enter, uh, make sure that you are muted and then try to remain muted uh, just so that there's minimal restrictions, uh, distractions rather. So um, my name is Morella. I'm the founder of Virtual Hand to Shoulder Fellowship. Um, for those of you that have joined these sessions, um, you're familiar with this hand, hand therapy brief sessions that we're doing. Um, this week, the focus is gonna be on complex hand injuries. I mean, I'm excited because I have uh, a VHSF faculty member, Ingrid Griesel. Um, she is located in South Africa. She completed the fellowship um, Ingrid, was it in 2021? Yes. And, uh, and then she sat for the CHT exam and she's now a certified hand therapist. So she's joined um, the faculty for VHSF. Um, and she's going to present a case study on this, um, which will um, be great to start applying some of these concepts that I'm just going to talk briefly about. So um, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. Uh, again, this is just a short 30-minute uh, session. So this is an overview on complex hand injuries. So when we're thinking about complex hand injuries, these are injuries that involve more than one type tissue type. So it can be involvement of bone, um, ligaments, tendons, nerves. There's multi-structure injury. Um, because of the nature of the trauma, they often require immediate surgery. The other consideration with complex hand injuries is that there could be other life-threatening injuries as well, and that would, of course, um, take uh, precedence. As far as the diagnostics, um, everything from radiographs to CAT scans, MRIs, Obviously with complex hand injuries, you can have even subtle fractures um, and obviously extensive soft tissue damage. So a number of diagnostics. Uh, the treatment plan is gonna be driven by the provider, but also in collaboration with the patient. Obviously these are um, traumatic events, uh, preparing patients with regards to um, potentially multiple procedures, unlikely multiple procedures, and also making them aware of different treatment options, the rehabilitation involved um, with those, and also what the outcome is. I think we can all appreciate the more that patients have an understanding of what to expect, um, both with regards to the treatment process, the rehabilitation process, um, the, the timeline um, to return to some level of function, I think all of that goes a long way um, to patients feeling better um, about their outcomes ultimately. Um, now, the challenges of rehab, again, you, these are complex injuries. There's going to be psychological um, sequela as well as the physical. Um, the aesthetics can become a, a, an area of significance that we might not um, necessarily be dealing with uh, routinely, but with complex hand injuries, um, then that can become certainly a consideration. I mean, then for us as therapists, the fact that we need to think about the progression of care with all of these different tissues that are healing along different timelines. So that's really um, the big challenge for us. Um, of course, we want to be uh, able to communicate with the referral source read op notes so that we have a thorough understanding of the procedures that were done. And then it's a matter of understanding um, wound healing processes for the different tissue types. Uh, we, we can use protocols, but a lot of times we're needing to think a little bit more independently. There's oftentimes not specific protocols when you've got these complex hand injuries. So we wanna have a thorough understanding of tissue healing timelines, the nature of the procedures that were done, be able to communicate with surgeons with regards to um, the timing of mobilizing patients and any kind of unique considerations uh, related to um, specific cases. So with the, the tissue healing considerations, it's really you know that these tissues are gonna heal 
on different timelines and when you've got multiple tissue injuries, we need to know what is the structure that needs the most protection. So um, we, we refer to that as the rate limiting step. It's the tissue that's really gonna, the, the tissue healing that needs the most uh, protection is gonna guide um, the progression of, of care. So when we think about um, healing for different tissue types for the blood, blood vessels, it's relatively a short healing timeline, just a, a couple of weeks of um, making sure we're protecting um, those healing tissues. And we're monitoring to make sure that we've got good healing. If we're dealing with vessels, making sure that we're seeing um, good perfusion and we're not seeing signs of um, any kind of insufficiency of blood flow, whether it's arterial or, um, or venous. Um, the skin, so skin, you know, also heals on, on this shorter timeline, but it will depend on the location. So we, we get our patients post-op, they may have sutures in, depending on the location of the sutures, the removal can be anywhere from 10 to 21 days with removal taking longer if it's over a joint. If there's grafts, they're gonna need more protection. So we wanna think about um, those considerations when patients have um, grafts and protecting those um, healing tissues. And if patients have any kind of um, comorbidities that can affect that healing timeline, that's another factor to take into consideration. Nerves. Um, they heal similar to other soft tissues. When we think about direct nerve repairs, they need to be protected from any kind of tension for three weeks. Tendons, typically in a complex hand injuries, we're, injury, we're going to be using an immobilization uh, protocol um, because there's uh, you know, these concomitant injuries. So usually we're mobilizing them around three to four weeks um, uh, with regards to uh, the tendons bones. Um, so we need radiographic healing to make sure that there's stability. Certainly when patients um, have intraarticular fractures, which are, are likely with complex hand injuries, um, we're, we're going to be dealing with sequela from that. Um, um, Post-traumatic arthritis, um, the cartilage um, is not well vascularized. It's not going to heal well. Um, so that's a consideration with outcomes. With ligaments, um, these are tissues that need to stabilize joints. So we want to make sure that we're um, protecting healing ligaments. At the same time, ligaments can become scarred and become a source of movement restriction. So then we're dealing with uh, ligaments in that way as well. So with multiple tissue um, uh, involvement, one of the ways you can organize care is by using a chart where you can um, identify all of the procedures that were done. So in this example, um, the TFCC repair, a wrist fracture, a nerve graft, all of these tissues with different healing timelines need, need to be accounted for. So by plotting it out on some kind of a chart, you can organize your care to make sure that um, the, the structure that needs the most protected uh, protection is leading um, the progression of care, of movement. Um, another component is going to be patient education. So obviously they need to learn um, movement exercises, maybe wound care considerations. We want to keep things as simple as possible because of, um, you know, that there's these complex injuries, there's usually the psychosocial um, sequela that accompany them. Uh, and it's possible that they might need additional support. So, you know, taking note uh, if they're having difficulties and making sure um, that that's communicated so that they could have that needed um, support. Other uh, parts of care will involve wound care to varying degrees. Um, so it might be just as simple as um, incision management, or we could be dealing with open wounds and we want to create an environment to support healing. Scar management, again, based on the stage of healing, we're going to be more gentle in those early phases of scar management. But as the collagen gains strength, we will take more progressive measures to manage scar because scar can be something that restricts mobility or, or causes pain. 
working on um, nerve related um, sequela like hypersensitivity or loss of sensation uh, would be another component of care. Uh, edema management. Now, one unique consideration with the complex hand injuries is if there were uh, vascular injuries and, and repairs, um, that there can be contraindications to elevation because it will create stress um, to those uh, anastomoses. So you need to be uh, really aware of the procedures that were done. Also in the presence of infection, um, uh, some of these edema management techniques would be contraindicated. Uh, other interventions uh, and orthoses, usually in the earliest phases, something protective, and it could be a resting hand orthoses potentially, um, but we wanna immobilize um, at, at a minimal level. So we wanna be able to have the patients mobilize the joints that they're allowed um, to move. So the orthotics gonna um, change over the course of the healing timeline. So as they progress with mobility, we can introduce um, mobilizing orthoses if they've got stiffness, uh, the use of orthoses can be applied for low load prolonged stretch. So we, we will use a, a, often a number of different types of orthotics. Uh, of course, then we wanna mobilize patients and we wanna follow that healing timeline. We wanna make sure um, that we are protecting all of those healing tissues. And again, we're gonna lead with um, the rate limiting step, um, just to make sure that we're protecting that most vulnerable um, healing tissue. Um, and everything from active to passive mobility will be based on where they are in their healing timeline and also um, based on the procedure that they had and the surgeon's also preference uh, for when these patients uh, get mobilized and to what extent. The use of modalities, uh, potentially the use of prosthetics. Uh, obviously, amputations can be the result of these uh, complex hand injuries. So um, going through that uh, rehab process and preparing them potentially for the use of prosthetics. And as they reach their uh, later phases of healing, then we're more progressive uh, working on restoring as much mobility as possible, but then working on strengthening and then, you know, that final step is really getting them back to their uh, full level of activity. So the purposeful activities, they can be introduced sooner, but always within the threshold of where their tissues are at on a healing timeline. Um, so we want to be conscientious of that. Um, the other way that purposeful activity would be introduced was would be in an adaptive uh, function. So to help patients maintain some a level of independence through adaptive techniques. So um, now what we'll do is turn our attention um, on to applying these kinds of concepts related to uh, a pa patient case. So I'm going to have Ingrid um, go ahead and share her screen um, and we can uh, start discussing the case study. And as you do that, Ingrid, can you um, just tell us a little bit about um, this patient, uh, how long you've been working with them? Uh, you know what? You just have to. Sure, thanks. Yeah. There you go. Yes, sorry. <laughs> thanks, Marilla. Um, so, yes, so can everyone see my screen? Is that a, a good? Yeah, All right. Perfect. So, um, this patient was referred to me at the beginning of October. Um, he had his second surgery on the 2nd of October. So I've been treating him since the 10th. So I haven't been treating him for very long. And his case is more complicated or more complex due to unfortunate mismanagement. And I think uh, just prolonged um, or a delay in getting correct treatment. So... He's a 24-year-old male. He works as a security guard uh, for a private security company um, here in South Africa. It was initially a workman's compensation case, um, but 
due to poor communication between himself and the doctor and the therapist and just misinformation. Um, the patient was told that he wasn't able to get further treatment under the, the workman's comp case and that if he wanted any further treatment, he would have to seek it privately. He was fortunate enough to be in that position, so he did get a second opinion, um, and that's how he's ended up being referred to myself. Um, so he sustained, um, or he accidentally shot himself in the hand, so at um, cl cl close proximity, he was um, doing a demonstration with his handgun, and he accidentally, he thought it was not loaded, and unfortunately it was loaded, and he discharged it straight into his hand, um, into his left hand, he's right hand, right hand dominant. So he sustained a fourth metacarpal fracture. The He had a zone six extensor tendon injury of the fourth finger, and a, between a zone two and three flexor tendon injury of the third finger. So it came through at a bit of an angle. Um, and it happened on the 1st of August. His first surgery, I'm, I'm unsure of the date, whether it was the first or the second or third, but it was early August where they initially uh, stabilized the fracture, um, oh, sorry, stabilized the fracture with K wires and did the tendon repairs and basically immobilized him. You can see on the X-ray how, um, he was basically just kept straight in a paddle uh, for for four weeks. He returned to the doctor. You can see that there was no way that the fracture was ever going to heal on its own with just the K-wire. That gap is just way too, too big. Um, and the surgeon then unfortunately refused to do further surgery except to remove the K-wires. So he, the patient decided to rather seek a second opinion without removing the K-wires. So the K-wires were in for a total of eight weeks, um, which has caused quite a bit of stiffness. His second surgery was then on the 10th of October, uh, yeah, 10th of October, uh, sorry, the 2nd of October, where they did a bone graft, um, or they removed the K-wires. They did a bone graft from the distal radius to the metacarpal, and they did a, um, an RF of the metacarpal fracture with the plate, and uh, they did a ten, uh, tenolysis of the extensor tendons and the flexor tendons, as well as a neuroly neurolysis of the digital nerves. So he was then referred to me on the 10th of um, October. I don't have his initial range of motions on the, on the slideshow, but the, this was his range of motion today when I saw him this morning. So you can see that he is quite stiff. So the black, the measurements in black um, are his active movement and the passive movement is the, the measurements in the red. So he has extension because he was kept straight basically for, for eight weeks, but his flexion is struggling quite a bit. It has however improved since the, in the, the first time I saw him um, and today. So his passive range of motion has improved quite a bit because I've given him some passive stretches and we've done a lot, um, some scar massage and that. So, but you can see here that he has quite a bit of adhesions because the active movement and the passive movement don't match. So um, he's got quite a bit of scarring. His wrist somehow is actually doing very well. Um, he's got basically full range of motion of his of his wrist, but the scar and his skin is extremely tight um, and thickened. So you can see, I'm not sure if you can see that the photo is a little bit bright, but he has the big scar on the uh, volar side of his hand, which is quite thickened and sensitive. He also, um, as a child, he said he was, um, it was before he turned one, uh, his finger got caught in something in a fence and ripped open. So you can see the the old scar on his middle finger that that was previously cut open. But that he said he did have 
functional movement. There was no issues with his middle finger, but he has the two the two scars now on his middle finger. Um, and then on the the dorsum of his hand, uh, where the bullet basically exited, you can see there's a whole chunk of tissue also missing, and his scar is extremely stuck. Um, the initial first time I saw him, his, his hand was just really sensitive to any type of touch um, because he, he hadn't touched it for about eight weeks by the time I saw him because he was just kind of scared of his hand and worried that any, any, um, anything that he did would ruin the second surgery. Um, and and I found out today, and I think that's also one of the reasons why he didn't touch his hand, is that the first therapist he saw was trying to mobilize him while the KYs were in his hand, which was obviously extremely painful. And um, I think he just avoided touching his hand, which made it quite sensitive. The fact that he doesn't develop CRPS was also a little bit of a miracle, I think, because he's been through quite a bit with his hand. But since I've seen him, there's been no further precautions from the doctor. And um, yeah, his MPs were feeling very hard initially, but they've loosened up since we've started some, some mobilization and um, exercises. So this was him the first day that I, or the, it was probably the second session I saw him, the 26th. So this is how his hand moves actively. So there's not a lot of move, active movement in the ring and the middle finger. And you can see his MPs are, are very stiff. Initially, his thumb web space was also very stiff. You can see it kind of comes straight into flexion and extension there, not much abduction. Um, and But his wrist has improved since, since then. So that was the initial movement. And this was just the, the assessment of his skin at the on the dorsum of his hand. It was very, very tight and his scars, there's not much glide happening at the back. Um, and yeah, so that was the about the second time I saw him, I think. And yeah, so he had, you can see, you could see in the first video, he had he has quite a bit of a tremor when he tries to move. And it only comes when he moves. So, um, yeah, that's just an observation I made. Um, stop. And then today, this is him. So today he's uh, three months post-injury and about um, a month post the second surgery. So he's doing quite well, uh, considering where we are and what his... So, we started some skin scraping, suction cups, a lot of scar massage, taught him how to do the scar massage, and it's loosened up quite a bit. So you can see his skin is more mobile than it was initially. It's still stuck, but it's, it is better than what we were working with before. And you can see how obvious the, the tissue loss is there uh, where the bullet exited um, his hand. And then, um, so this is just the movement, the active flexion of his, um, just, so the active flexion of the middle finger that had the flexor tendon injury. So passively he moves really well, um, but actively there isn't much movement. And he, he can, you can almost, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but in, uh, in person you could actually kind of see how it gets stuck uh, just underneath the scar. Where it's pulling, but but not much is happening at the joint. And you can, um, see, you can see the skin pulling in your video. Yes, yes. So you can see the tendon is trying, but it's just not getting past that scar. It is, however, better. So this is it, it's not great yet, but it's better than what we started with. Um, and then uh, let's just go. So the treatment we've done since I started seeing him on the 10th, uh, I initially splinted him because of the bone graft and um, doctor just wanted to give him, I think, a little bit of support. So we splinted him in a wrist extension splint 
which was discharged at six weeks, uh, excuse, um, at four weeks. And we've done a lot of scar massage, um, just trying to get that scar to move and that skin to move. Suction cups, you can see up here, uh, just to get the scar to lift a little bit and to get a little bit more blood flow to the back of his, the, the skin on the back of his hand. Lots of skin scraping um, that I've recently only started doing since I attended Alison Taylor's course, which has made quite a big difference for him. I also gave him um, tools to be able to do it at home as well. So he, his wife has been helping him uh, do it as, at home, which I think has made quite a difference in the passive range that we, we saw this week. Um, doing joint mobilizations at the MPs, especially at all the joints, but specifically at the MP joints, um, just to increase movement because that initial keeping him still at basically straight um, has caused those MPs to, to get really stiff. Lots of passive movements, especially before mobilizing that tendon um, and getting the joints to, to loosen up before we do active movements. Uh, the K tape. I this was how I taped him today, which he did feel made. Uh, he felt made quite a difference. So I taped it from um from his fingers to his wrist, so that the recoil would be towards his fingers, so that we could glide the skin more distally, so that we could get a bit more flexion. And he he tremored less, which was it was a, just an observation, and um, he was able to flex actively a little bit more. I didn't measure. Uh, the, the active movement, but it just visually, it looked like he was moving a bit better and he felt better. And then lots of active movements. So the isolated blocking, uh, composite flexion, and we've started a little bit more passive, um, or I want to say a little bit more aggressive passive movement at the fingers uh, for him to do at home and then functional tasks in ADL. So because the splint has been discharged, He's basically doing all his ADLs with both hands now, uh, just to get hopefully some more movement, but also just to start a little bit of strengthening. All right. There's some comments. I don't know if you chat. have any questions, Marilla. Yeah, there's questions okay. in the chat. <clears throat> so I'll go one by one. The first uh, comment question is um, that um, there's seems to be psychosocial related um, issues going on. Um, so with regards to that aspect and also, um, his, his ability to go back to work, what's his status on that level? So, um, he returned to work. He's now doing, um, accommodated duties. So he's obviously not able to handle a gun at the moment. Uh, so he's now basically on desk duty. So he watches the monitors and, um, uh, does phone calls and admin related stuff but I did push him to get back to work because he is um, quite dependent on his full salary uh, so he when in South Africa if we have workman's comp they only get 75% for three months after they were injured so 75% of their salary so financially he was quite motivated to return to work which helped on my side um, but and his employer was also willing to accommodate him, um, which has made his return to work easier. So he is back at work, but definitely on an accommodated duty because he can't handle a gun. Um, Are you able to communicate well, with the surgeon on the like the healing of the bone? Are you like in close communication with the surgeon? What's your um, like with, access with to this, so we we don't have so he hasn't had x-rays he only had his in like in theater x-rays uh since the second surgery mm -hmm. but once he's had his second um set of x-rays i think it's i think he told me today it was either next week or the week after that he'll have his second x-rays um the the surgeon often informs us. So with the surgeon he's seeing now, we are in, in close contact with him. So if there's any issues, we normally just find the surgeon directly. Uh, but the, the first surgeon, obviously we don't have much contact with, with that surgeon. Mm -hmm. 
So like when you're um, progressing things like mobility and there's a healing fracture, do you like vet what you're doing with the surgeon? How do you know, like in a case like this, he had a bone graft, he's plated just to ensure that you're within like the parameters of what's allowed. Yes. So we check with the surgeon before we start. And then um, if we progressing, so I do go a little bit on the, on the patient's pain. So sometimes the surgeon says, just go for it, but the patient is quite sore. And then I, I slow down a bit, but also in, in times where the patient's doing really well, um, I do uh, then ask the surgeon if he's okay, if we continue with that. But I normally go um, with what the surgeon wants Um depending on the patient if if the patient's not comfortable i don't i don't force the patient to to do something they're not comfortable with. sure um just going on yeah. with other questions in the chat yes. uh, someone asked what areas were uh the skin scraping techniques focused on so we i initially did both sides so the the dorsum of his hand uh basically where i was doing the the suction cups um and as well as the flexor side, today I didn't do the flexor side so much. We, ju we were just a little bit under time pressure, um, but I focused mainly on the, the dorsum because he's struggling a lot with uh, flexion. And he says that it's it feels like it's pulling from the back. So he de definitely has restrictions on the flexor side as well. But I think there's a lot of, there's, his skin is just not gliding on the dorsum of his hand. Okay. And then another question related to the use of um, static progressive orthoses for the MP joints. Is that something that, because you just, you've only seen him a couple of times. Is that something that's on your plan with him? So, um, yeah. So I think definitely once the surgeon has cleared us to, to possibly start that, I would maybe do something like that uh, just to get a bit more, more MP flexion, but I don't, I don't find it always practical and it often hurts patients. So I don't do static progressive very often unless it's like uh, I have no other options left. Um, so I'll first start with pro possibly just a little bit more aggressive passive movements. Um, but I don't like, I don't personally don't like static progressive a lot because it causes, I find it causes quite a bit of pain. Mm -hmm. And then they tend to swell and then they end up getting more stiff. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd rather do a more controlled, um, passive, passive uh, home exercise program than like a forced, the forcedness of a, pa a static progressive splint. Okay. Um, okay. I just see Alex also asked the question, what tool did I give him for the scraping on his own? So we just, I, we have tongue depressors in the in the practice, so I gave him a, a wooden tongue depressor that he's just scratching um, or scraping the back of his his hand with. So we didn't give him anything fancy. It was just it's something that we that we found that that also helps, um, and it's cost effective. Um, one question about what's under the K tape is that what's under the K tape is oh. it? So it's just micropore or paper tape. Um, so it's, I don't know if, if, if that's something you're familiar with, Marilla. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I just, I normally, if I, if there is a scar, I normally cover it with, with micropore just to protect it a little bit because it's a little bit sensitive and I'm always worried that they rip that K tape off and they hurt the scar. So it's mm -hmm. just, to, just a little bit of a barrier to protect the, the K tape. Mm -hmm. uh, let's um, see. Do you have pics of the K tape? So this is the only one I didn't take uh, the ones the way I taped it last week. Um, I'm really bad with taking photos of treatment. I need to get better with that. But this was today's K tape. Um, I don't know if you can can see my my screen yeah. today. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So that was the the, the K tape I did today. Uh, sorry, I didn't have last week's ones. <laughs> and this this is to facilitate edema reduction and also manage the scar, or was it mostly just focused on the scar? It was it was focused on the scar and then getting that skin to glide a little bit more over the the MP joints. So I the the way I uh, taped it, it was I stuck it on just under the PIT, and then kind of did a complete flexion and and pulled it tight. 
so that the recoil would be towards the, the PIP joint. Gotcha. Um, and Leisha, if you want to unmute yourself and just clarify your question, um, you can do that. I just want to make sure we're answering your question. I'm not unclear um, about what your question is. Uh, uh, Jim now asked, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Maria. Oh, you go, go ahead. ahead. No, Janelle just asked if he had flashbacks. Uh, I haven't specifically asked him. Um, I must say, personality-wise, I almost want to say it's happened to the best person it could have happened to because he's a very relaxed person and he's not too, not too concerned. So he doesn't have the an anxious type of personality, um, which I think is going to help us in the rehab. But I haven't specifically asked him whether whether he gets flashbacks and whether he's actually held the gun since then, because I think even holding the gun the first time after the injury is probably also going to bring back a whole bunch of emotions, which we'll cross once we get there. Uh, someone asked about specifically uh, edema management and what you're doing for that. So he actually doesn't have too much edema. He, the initial, the first day he did, uh, we just did manually meet edema massage um, and some elevation and just getting him moving because by the time he saw me, he was kind of so afraid to move. He just kind of kept it still. So um, it was basically just moving and then the retrograde massage. Um, but he doesn't have too much edema at, the, at this stage, um, which which is also helping us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, excellent. And I see. Oh, go ahead. But, I just want to read Leisha's question. Would it be that? Right? Um, so yeah, I just but... want to clarify the Dur Durand splint. Is that, do you mean the one with the, the, the wrist flex. elastics or the wrist flex? No. It's just a dorsal block with the wrist flexed and the MP scan. Um. So um, I think it's it's difficult to say. I think I've worked with surgeons who said that they would rather sacrifice the extensor tendon, get the flexor tendon fixed, and then fix the extensor tendon later. But I think because of the extent of his metacarpal fracture, they were more focused on getting the fracture healed uh, before worrying about what the tendons were doing. I do think they could have positioned his MPs a little bit better um initially so because they i think on that first i don't know if you can see on the first um oh, that one the ky kind of went through the through the joint which i think they just had a, it had they had a tough time trying to fix a bone that had been, uh, lost a third of its length i think um but i think that was this is why we're struggling with the, the MP flexion is because they kept it straight for, for too long. Um, but I don't think, I think their the main focus in the beginning was the bone and the tendons came after that. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, Alicia. Uh, All right, well, maybe we can uh, do an update as you uh, complete care with him, I think he'll be under your care for some yes, time. Yes, it'll be. Um, and maybe we can do an update at a later date. Um, so I see one final question and then we'll, we'll end there just because I know we've gone a little bit over. Someone asked whether he's doing the K-tape on his own at home. Has he been taught how to apply it or is it something you're just doing for him? The, at this stage, it's something I'm doing just for him because I'm seeing him weekly. Um, so it basically lasts until I see him the next time. Um, and then I also like like to see what happens if they don't wear cape tape for a couple of days and whether they can actually feel a difference. So I don't like keeping them in it all the time, um, just to see whether whether it is effective in the sense if if they take it off and they feel that it gets a bit tighter or that it felt better with the K tape, then we know that it is working. Where if they constantly wear it, they kind of don't really know if it's working or not working. 
So um, at this stage, he's not doing his own K tape, but um, because it's because I see him weekly. Normally, if I start to see them a bit less, then I do equip them to do to do it at home if it if it's effective. Okay, great. So I think we've got all the questions. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and then Ingrid for taking the time to put this together and share this case uh, on your complex hand injury. And I hope you guys will join us again. Um, we're doing these over the next few weeks. Um, so um, I, once you've registered once, you're registered for all of them and I'll send reminders. Um, and if you know of others that might be interested, um, share the link with them and we will see you next week. Have a great uh, evening or afternoon. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Marilla.